couple of months ago, I went on a short trip to Scotland and spent a couple of days in Edinburgh. While there, we went on a ghost walk and learnt some interesting stories from Edinburgh's dark past. One of those was the story of Burke and Hare, two men who were responsible for the murders of 16 people, and that's the case that we'll discuss today. Before I get started, I just want to say that it's looking like I might hit a thousand subscribers within the next week or two, so thank you so much to everyone who's subscribed. If you have any questions for the Q&A, please feel free to leave them in the comments. If you enjoy mysteries, true crime, disappearances and the occasional conspiracy, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. In the early 19th century, Edinburgh was a leading centre of anatomical study. Back then, bodies could legally be used for medical study if they had died in prison of suicide or if they were orphans. Because of this, there was a shortage of corpses available to be studied, and this led to what were known as resurrection men digging up recently buried bodies and selling them for dissection. William Burke and William Hare were both born in Ireland and moved to Scotland where Burke initially worked as a labourer and Hare worked as a coalman's assistant. Burke had a comfortable upbringing and served in the army in his teenage years. He was married for a short while but deserted his wife and family after an argument with his father-in-law. After some time in Scotland, he married Helen McDougall, who he nicknamed Nellie. Hare was quite a mysterious man, no one knows exactly when he was born and other details of his life are questionable. He was described as illiterate, violent and immoral. He lodged in a man named Logue's house, and when Logue died in 1826, it is thought that Hare married his wife, Margaret. This hasn't actually been confirmed as far as I could tell, but it does seem likely. The two at least lived together and were very close and had some kind of relationship. Burke and Hare met in 1827, and after becoming friends, Burke and Nellie moved into Hare's lodging house. On the 29th of November that year, one of the lodgers at Hare's house died. He owed Hare four pounds in rent money. I'm not sure exactly how much that would equate to now, but obviously it's more than it sounds. So Burke and Hare decided to sell the man's body to reclaim some of the money that they were owed in rent. A little paranoid as this was their first time doing this, they were very careful and after the coffin arrived, they removed the body from the coffin, hid it under the bed and then refilled the coffin with bark and resealed it, hoping that no one would realise that the body was missing. This was actually kind of pointless really because while resurrection men were frowned upon at the time, what they did wasn't illegal. They took the corpse to Edinburgh University where they managed to sell it to Dr Robert Knox for £7.10, and shillings, covering the lost rent money and a nice little profit too. One of Dr Knox's assistants told the men that they'd gladly do business again if only they could find more bodies. As I'm sure you already guessed, the two men didn't stop there and they didn't just take advantage of people who were already dead. Surprised at how easy it had been to make that money, but concerned that there wasn't going to be a continuous supply of people dying of natural causes at the lodging house, they came up with a genius idea to actually start causing the deaths themselves and supplying the bodies. It's hard to work out exactly what happened and when. Burke and Hare's confessions were hardly congruent to say the least, and Burke's own story changed on more than one occasion, but it's generally believed that their first murder was in January or February 1928. Most historians believe that a man named Joseph, who was lodging at the house, was Burke and Hare's first victim. Joseph was ill, he had a fever and had become delirious, and Hare was concerned that keeping him at the house would be bad for business. So he and Burke gave him lots of whiskey, and Burke laid on his chest while Hare suffocated him with a pillow. Later victims were suffocated by Burke's hands over their mouth and nose. Again, they sold the body to Dr Knox and this time he paid them even more, £10, which undoubtedly egged the two men on to continue their sinister job. Of course, Burke and Hare were awful people, but they were also kind of smart in their murders. The method they chose would have left no signs of murder, at least none that would have been detectable so long before modern forensics. Burke lying over the victim's chest would lower their chances of fighting back and it also would have minimised the noise at the time of the murder. It wouldn't have looked good if lodgers in the house had heard a man screaming and then suddenly is found dead. The next victim is thought to be an Englishman whose name is unknown. He became ill with jaundice and just like with Joseph, Hare became concerned that this would be bad for business. It's hard to say if Hare really did even think this or if it was just his messed up way of rationalising killing another person. I mean, I'm sure the profit would have been enough motive for him. At this point, they'd been pretty lucky in a sense. Three different men had all become pretty ill at the lodging house and Burke and Hare could maybe debate that they might have died anyway, so killing them was not totally unjustified. But then they got greedy. 
and they realised that relying on lodgers who were almost at death's door anyway could seriously limit the supply of dead bodies, so they decided to start luring people in, people that probably wouldn't be missed if they were murdered. According to Burke, the next victim was a woman named Abigail on the 12th of February 1828. This was the only specified date in any of Burke's confessions. She lived close to Edinburgh, travelling there to sell salt, and when she arrived at the lodging house, Burke made sure that she got so drunk that she would be unable to return home. It's assumed they killed Abigail in the same way as Joseph and the other man, and again received £10 for the body. According to Burke, Dr Knox approved of the body being so fresh, but did not ask any questions, just as with the previous bodies. The two men are thought to have killed another elderly woman either later that month or in early March. In April, Burke met Mary Patterson and Janet Brown. He bought them drinks before inviting them back to his brother's house for breakfast. Mary fell asleep shortly after they arrived, but Burke and Janet talked for a while until Nellie, Burke's wife, burst in and started arguing with Burke. Burke had quite a temper, he threw a glass at Nellie which cut her eye. Janet didn't realise that Burke was married and decided to leave after Nellie arrived, but left Mary there sleeping. Nellie also left shortly after and went to get Hare and Margaret, presumably because they'd found a new victim. For whatever reason, Burke and Hare locked their wives out of the room and killed Mary while she slept. As with each previous murder, they sold the body to Dr Knox, but this time he realised that the body was still warm and that the woman was pretty young and seemingly healthy, so he questioned how they acquired it. One of the assistants recognised Mary, she'd been a prostitute and was relatively well known to the local people. Burke just stated that she'd drunk herself to death and that he'd bought her body from an old woman. Which obviously sounds pretty shady, but Dr Knox didn't press too much, just seemed happy to have another body to dissect, so he didn't bother reporting the suspicious circumstances. This time he only paid £8 for the body though. I'm not sure if this had anything to do with the circumstances, or if at this point he just had a good supply of bodies so wasn't paying as much, or if it was for another reason entirely. Janet later came searching for her friend, but was told that she'd moved to Glasgow with a travelling salesman. The next victim was a woman named Mrs Haldane who lodged at the house, followed by her daughter, Margaret or Peggy, a few months later, who Burke killed alone without Hare's help. Dr Knox again paid £8 for this body, but this went back up to £10 when Burke and Hare brought their next victim, an old woman whose name isn't known. Again, I've no idea why the price kept fluctuating, I mean it's not as if it depended on the quality of the corpse, so to speak, or Mary's body would have probably earned them the most money. Burke and Hare continued to murder more people that year, mostly women. Some people believe that the number of victims was actually higher than officially confirmed, seeing as we can't really trust either man's version of events. In June, an elderly woman and her mentally disabled grandson came to stay at the lodging house. While the boys sat by the fire, they murdered his grandma in the bedroom by the usual method. They then picked up the boy and went to murder him in the same room as his grandma, but this time using a different method. This time, they lifted the boy up and broke his back over Burke's knee. Burke later said that this was the murder that stuck with him the most. The expression on the boy's face when it happened stuck with Burke long after he took the boy's life, but of course this wasn't enough to end the killing spree. Burke and Hare actually fell out for a short while when Burke went away with Nellie to visit her father. When they returned, they suspected that Hare had murdered another victim. Before they left, he'd been short of cash and now he had plenty and had even bought himself new clothes. Hare denied he had killed anyone while the couple had been away, but Burke went to ask Dr Knox, who confirmed that he'd bought a body from Hare for £8. This led to a fight between the two men, and Burke and Nellie went to stay with Burke's cousin a couple of streets away. By October, they were friends again and went on to murder two more women, one of whom was a relative of Nellie's. The next victim was an 18-year-old man who was mentally disabled and had a limp caused by deformed feet. He was well known by people in Edinburgh who referred to him as Daft Jamie. Hare lured him to the lodging house, promising him whiskey, which he accepted, but he didn't really like to drink in excess so he wasn't as drunk as their previous victims. He was also stronger than the other victims and put up a fight, but he was overpowered and killed in the same way as the others. After his belongings were stolen, his body was sold to Dr Knox and several of his students recognised the man as Daft Jamie. Dr Knox denied this and when word got around that Jamie was missing, he quickly dissected the body, removing its head and feet before any of the other ones that he had in storage. Until this point, I guess you could maybe argue that Dr Knox didn't really know that the bodies were murder victims. I mean, it was definitely suspicious the amount of bodies that Burke and Hare was supplying, but if he just didn't really think to press any further and ask any more questions, maybe you could buy that he didn't know. 
But how he handled this body, dissecting it before the police even had a chance to examine it, just seems really suspicious. I suppose even if he didn't know until now, he probably realised how bad it had looked if anyone started investigating this. But it's just hard to believe that with the amount of bodies he was buying, that he didn't even wonder where they were coming from. The final victim was Margaret Doherty, and she was killed on Halloween, the 31st of October, 1828. Burke led her to his cousin's lodging house, where two other lodgers, Anne and James Gray, were also staying. Burke and Hare paid Anne and James to spend the night at Hare's lodging house, telling them that Margaret was a relative. Anne and James returned the next day and found Margaret's body in a pile of straw. Nellie tried to bribe them not to go to the police, offering them £10 a week, though they refused and reported the murder. While they went to the police, Burke and Hare quickly sent the body to Dr Knox, but somehow, even realising that they might have been busted this time, it still didn't even stop them from taking Margaret's belongings. Police arrived and found Margaret's blood-stained clothes under the bed and arrested Burke, Hare, both the wives and Burke's cousin, but Burke's cousin was released shortly after. Initially, the police could only link Burke and Hare to the murder of Margaret Doherty, but soon rumours started in Edinburgh and every missing person was believed to have been a victim of Burke and Hare. Because most of the bodies had already been disposed of and back then forensic techniques weren't what they are today, the police knew that it would be hard to pin all of the murders on Burke and Hare, so they decided to try and get a confession out of Hare, offering him immunity for implicating Burke. As the law prevented him from testifying against his wife, she was also immune from prosecution. Hare accepted and confessed, but minimised his involvement, implying it was Burke that did the murdering and he helped Burke take the bodies to Dr Knox. Despite murdering 16 people, Burke and Nellie were only tried for the murders of Margaret Doherty, Jamie Wilson and Mary Patterson. The prosecution felt that these were the murders that had the most evidence tying Burke and Nellie. They had to be tried for each murder separately, as the defence argued that it wasn't fair to try Burke for a murder where Nellie had no involvement. But this made no difference, and Burke was found guilty of Margaret's murder and sentenced to death, with Nellie being released as her involvement couldn't be proven. Burke eventually realised that he had no hope of getting away with any of his crimes, so he decided to confess. He stated that he and Hare were intoxicated when they committed each murder, and implied that he took no pride in the murders, drinking often and taking drugs to ease his conscience. Burke was hanged on the 28th of January 1928, and his body was publicly dissected before being donated to the Anatomical Museum of the Edinburgh Medical School, where it remains to this day. Dr Knox was also facing prosecution, though didn't end up facing charges thanks to Burke's statement. Of course, people were very curious to know how Dr Knox didn't realise that the bodies were murder victims. He explained this by claiming he thought Burke and Hare were just watching many poor lodging houses and buying bodies of people who died before funeral arrangements could be made. It was determined that his role in all this was immoral, but not illegal. As for Hare and his wife, and Nelly, after being harassed by mobs of people, they all left Edinburgh individually, but it's not known where they ended up and what happened to them after they left. It's possible that more people may have been involved in the murders, or at least known it was happening and done nothing to stop it. Burke claimed four murders happened at his cousin's house, so how likely is it that he had no idea what was going on? The Burke and Hare murders played a big role in the 1832 Anatomy Act, which authorised dissection on bodies from workhouses that had not been claimed within 48 hours. While still debatably not the most ethical decision, it was implemented to reduce the incentive for anatomy murders. So that's the story of Burke and Hare. It's quite unbelievable that Burke was the only one that actually faced the consequences of his actions and that Nellie, as well as Hare and his wife, just got away with it all. Most don't believe that the wives actually murdered anyone themselves, but they knew what was happening and apparently even encouraged it, so they were just as guilty as their husbands. It does seem like Burke and Hare initially started their killing spree purely for financial gain, but debatably even started to enjoy it. Their methods evolved from the most logical way to kill someone and get away with it back then, to breaking a boy's back over their knee, and I couldn't find out exactly how Margaret, the final victim, died, but if her clothes were bloodstained, it sounds like her death was more violent than the others. Maybe they just got carried away, who knows, maybe if they hadn't gotten sloppy, they would never have been caught. As for Dr Knox, if he wasn't directly involved himself, I do believe that he at least suspected that the bodies he was receiving were murder victims, but he probably just didn't care because it was just more bodies for him to dissect. No matter who murdered the victims, they were all responsible in their own way, and again, it's just quite unbelievable that 
Burke was the only one that actually got punished for his actions. Even 200 years later, Burke and Hare are still quite iconic characters in Edinburgh, with their story being told in every ghost walk, in every tour of the dungeon, there's even a pub named after the pair. But all that remains of them to this day is Burke's skeleton, plus a notebook made out of his skin and a letter written in his blood. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing and leave your thoughts in the comments as well as any questions you might have for the Q&A. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.